Okay. Uh, let me introduce you, Mr. Michael Meeks. Thank you, thank you for that. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Hello, so today I want to talk about LibreOffice, and I'm going to talk about LibreOffice on your GPU. So, exciting. This is the, this is the overview of what I'm about to say. Um, why use the GPU? You know, this is, I think, a, a good question. I don't know if any one of you have looked at nice pictures of dyes, of, of, of chips inside your hardware in recent times. Um, but the GPU bit is this, this huge, fertile land of usefulness, you know? And um, in Linux, I don't know if you, you've been a long-term Linux user, but we've tried to use this, uh, you know, this wonderful, powerful uh, stuff for all sorts of things. Um, you know, Compiz, if you recall, back in the day, you know, uh, the, the cube of your desktop and so on. And, and that, that's great. Of course, you can flick it uh, around and you can draw uh, ripples on your desktop and all of that good stuff. Um, but after a while, you stop doing that and you carry on working, right? At which point, the GPU is effectively completely idle. Um, and, you know, of course, you can composite every frame at 60 frames a second with a beautiful, uh, you know, uh, drop shadow around it. Uh, but again, you know, things don't change unless the monkey is, you know, slamming the keys. Uh, so, you know, what can we use this beautiful piece of hardware for that actually is useful uh, to people uh, in business? And so uh, these days, of course, it's, it's pretty hard not to buy a GPU. Um, lots of people buy two. Obviously, they buy, you know, they buy some kind of um, integrated one, and then they buy another thing alongside it, which is uh, particularly cool. Oh, hi, Julie. Um, and, uh, but but there's, just, you know, there's just loads of this estate sitting there uh, not doing anything. And um, I'm afraid virtually all the graphs in my presentation are log plots, because it turns out that to, to, to grasp the, the sheer difference in, in performance between uh, you know, something that's 1.8 teraflops and something that's 58 gigaflops or something, um, it, takes, it takes a log plot to actually uh, get, get a grasp. But hopefully we're, um, we're, we're grown up uh, math uh, majors who can understand these things. Um, anyhow, a double precision, sadly, is, is significantly slower uh, in a lot of these things. And precision is not really uh, a negotiable uh, factor in spreadsheets. Uh, you, you can't, you know, I mean, people get very upset if the numbers are wrong. And so, so we're determined that they won't be. Uh, so uh, we use a, a full IEEE uh, 764, which basically, for the uninitiated, um, you've probably tried designing a, a hardware uh, adder or, or, or you know, an ALU in your uh, early, early days, perhaps. And, and you're aware that 64 is a nice number, uh, but actually the mantissa of a double doesn't really have 64 bits. You can't shove that all in uh, at the end. It only has 53 and a half or, or, or something like this, right? Um, but really, we want to get that full precision, and, and most GPUs uh, and most um, FPUs, I guess, inside the CPU side, um, really deal in these much more precise doubles, and then they try and avoid converting them uh, as they sort of go out into uh, memory. And so uh, some of our work has actually helped with precision, um, I think, quite, quite a bit. The other thing that's interesting about uh, GPUs is that uh, you get better power usage. You know, if you can choose between doing it on the CPU and doing it on the GPU, actually going at a lower frequency and just much wider and using that estate there and powering the CPU down, in theory, uh, can, can help you a lot. Of course, there's, a, there's some slight caveats around GPUs, like what they can and can't do, um, and what they can and can't do efficiently. But if you've seen Gliffy, I don't know, have, has anyone seen Beth Dad's new trendy font renderer? You should. It's, it's, an, it's, it's an even more impressive abuse of, um, of a GPU than what I'm showing you. In fact, it's in a completely different ballpark. It's, uh, it's quite amazing. And uh, so he renders individual glyphs, uh, in individual pixels in glyphs using uh, fragment shaders um, in some amazing ways. So, so it's amazing what GPUs can do. They can even mine Litecoin for you, you know? Uh, one in three of you is a Litecoin millionaire already, you know, just by uh, using your GPU uh, for other stuff. The other thing I should mention is that whilst I've been uh, involved in this in uh, some quite profound ways, the, the people who've been really doing the, the difficult stuff uh, are these guys. So Kohei, uh, you know, just uh, maintaining great chunks of the Calc core and refactoring it, providing this, this library, MDDS. So if you want a spreadsheet, if you want to write a new spreadsheet, and you know, everyone likes to write a new one every now and then, um, there's a whole load of libraries, MDDS, which are template libraries, which take the great chunks of the Calc core, and you can reuse those in your own application, and he, he maintains that. And then, of course, using that in LibreOffice, uh, Marcus, who's uh, some, somehow here at the, at the back, uh, doing some great things around charting, and uh, Matush, I think, probably uh, here also. And MultiCoreWare, of course, uh, some, some experts in the OpenCL piece uh, doing that there. AMD, uh, you know, inspiring and funding this, um, as they've done so many other things. I mean, if you, if you talk to the GIMP guys or the Gaggle guys or ImageMagic, you know, you'll see that, in fact, this is only one small piece of a very rich puzzle 
uh, whereby OpenCL is being used to accelerate all sorts of free software so it will run much quicker out of the box. You won't even notice that the workload is being moved uh, to these much faster uh, compute units. So here is an early spreadsheet, um, or well, 3000 BC, I don't know. A quick, quick general knowledge question, uh, Cleopatra's needle, a nationality of Cleopatra, you know, where are the Ptolemies, are they? You know, sound Egyptian, don't they? Got a P at the front. It's a triumph of branding, just so you know. They're really Greek rulers that came in uh, uh, from elsewhere. Either way, um, the aspect ratio of this needle, which doesn't show up very well, I'm, I'm sorry about that. They've been building at the top of it, and it's uh, clad in white uh, plastic. It's about eight to one, and it's got a, a nice inscription all the way down, and uh, you know, it's marketing, basically. Uh, you know. uh, and, and they're hoping, of course, uh, to encourage people to make the business decision not to attack the Egyptians. And, and steal all their stuff. Like, I think this one's in Paris, actually. So, it, you know, uh, it didn't work terribly well uh, in the long term, but uh, in the short term probably did. And interestingly, spreadsheets are used to make business decisions. If you look at what spreadsheets are used for, most people don't create a spreadsheet just for fun, you know? I mean, some people do. I, you know, I do it because it's actually, it is quite fun, you know? Um, but, but most people get raw data and they crunch it in their spreadsheet and because they want to make a business decision, right? You know, uh, you know, are pink cars selling or are black cars selling, you know? And if black is the new pink, then, you know, either we run an ad campaign saying pink is the new black, or uh, we make more pink ones, right, or black ones, or, you know, wh whatever. We make a business decision. We don't just fool around. Uh, we, we're, we're actually using this tool. And so the question is, you know, can we actually use all of this graphics hardware we have lying around to make some better business decisions uh, quicker. I have um, uh, some pictures of more modern spreadsheets. Um, Excel 2000 and up to 2003 had a 64 by 256K uh, limit, so it's basically uh, this shape. I've tried to get the shapes uh, in proportion. Excel 2010 made it a lot longer, but also slightly wider, so it's, it's a really a broom handle aspect ratio. So when we, when we come to data structures, uh, which way do you think it's best to organize your data structure, you know, to be linear in which, which dimension? Well, we choose columns. That, that, seems, that seems longer. Um, interestingly, our com competition choose rows, so strangely. Anyhow, uh, spreadsheet core data storage is, is quite a, an interesting uh, uh, topic. So if you read the abstract of this talk, you, you would have noticed it was written by a, you know, a drink-fueled drink madman. Um, but it, it did um, uh, mention some of the terrible data structures that we, in, we inherited uh, in the core. And so, uh, you know, I'll just walk you uh, quickly through. I suppose I should have a pointer or some magic thing, shouldn't I? Either way, um, so at the top you see the, there's a document on the left-hand side. It all lives inside a document. And then uh, this is drawn by Kohei and Stanley, and it's, it's a brilliant picture, isn't it? And then each of the tabs in your worksheet is an SC table, and each of the columns in that is effectively, a, was effectively a linear array like this, going down of pointers. Actually, pointers and row numbers, to be more precise, so row one, pointed to a cell, row two, pointed to a cell, row three. So an integer and a pointer each, each time you went down that. And then we would allocate cells you know, randomly scattered across the memory. And each of those cells would be a, an object, because object-oriented programming is, is more of a religion than a, um, you know, it's, it's a way of life, yeah. Anyway, so, uh, and each of these objects would be, you know, all cells are pretty much the same, as we know, and, and so they would have these four fields in the base class, and then they would be derived. There'd be a string, a string object, a value cell, uh, an edit, editable string. So this has kind of got some rich, rich text formatting on it, like bold, italics, this thing. Uh, a cell with nothing in it except a note, although the note pointer was actually in the base class, so any cell could have a note pointer, and a formula, um, formula cell type. So uh, this, this leads to a number of interesting problems. This idea that there is a cell inside a spreadsheet, or a, a spreadsheet is a lot of cells, and a cell should be an object, and you should be able to do things on that object, is a very popular, uh, popular one. So popular that it spread all throughout the code. Uh, the whole of calc uh, was basically dealing in cells. You know, want a cell? Yeah, yeah, a cheap one. You know, go on here, you've got nothing in it. Three, you know. And, and so the problem is that, you know, it infects everything, this decision, this very fundamental design decision. And so when we realize that actually this is something we need to improve, that there's quite a significant amount of work. So um, Kohei managed to spend two weeks with it not even compiling, um, you, know, like, you know, massive. After doing a whole load of incremental work to get to the point that he had to do the last two-man week chunk to get rid of this, um, and managed to finally isolate all of that in these document iterators so that the iterators know about, knew about the structure, uh, but the rest of the code didn't which is a pretty, uh, pretty useful place to be. So yes, just disinfecting lots of that uh, structural stuff. And writing unit tests. One of the great things about LibreOffice, of course, is 
that we finally have very significant unit tests covering you know, lots of our bugs and lots of things that might be bugs in, in the future. So, so that's pretty cool. So you recall this is how it used to look. And having done that big refactor, we could change it to be like this. Now this uh, superficially has all the same information in it, but it's arranged in different places. Okay? So if you want to, for example, have a whole column of doubles, uh, you know, you've got a document, inside it you'll have a sheet, inside that you'd have a column, and that would then have a block of doubles. It would just be a single contiguous memory allocation with, well, eight megabytes of doubles. If you fill the entire column with doubles, it's a million, million rows, eight megabytes is not really a very big number, is it? I don't know how we manage to persuade ourselves that a million rows is a big number, you know? Like, what? What do you, you know, how, anyway. So how, how did that happen? But, but anyhow, there's uh, then these contiguous rows of, of nice sort of pristine uh, virgin data that you can actually uh, you know, operate on in a nice way. And then, of course, broadcasters, cell notes, and various other things split out. Cell notes particularly almost never used. Uh, well, you know, there are some pathological cases, but many sheets don't use them. And so, you know, significant memory savings uh, just from doing this. But in terms of calculation, our, our iteration over cells used to be uh, something like this. I mean, this is simplified, uh, removing lots of craft. Uh, we have a, a value iterator inside that even does filtering, and there's, you know, every, every time you went around this loop, there was just this, not just a massive switch statement, there was a, a function call, and umpteen reads, and crazy stuff, and 15 options to the iteration function, all of which were checked. And so every time you add a single double, it would do, you know, hundreds of instructions. Um, but basically, at the center of your, your inner loop, if you could call it an inner loop, and if it was as optimal as this, which it wasn't, um, you basically have something that looks like this, a switch statement. And this is not terribly good uh, for, for a number of reasons. And of course, these days, it looks much more like this. Now, of course, this is also a simplification. And uh, as any fool will tell you, you don't want to write code like this. You want to write custom assembly, because real men write custom assembly, right? Um, and, and not just for one CPU, but for every CPU you know. And then you should you know, check which CPU it is and use a, the SSE 3 PNI, you know, instruction extension so you can avoid blah, blah, blah. Yeah. On the other hand, you could just trust your compiler that it will vectorize the most mind-blowingly easy use cases probably quite well. Um, and, uh, or, but, but of course, you know, the, the compiler vectorizer is, is, is a very conservative thing because, as everyone knows, <clears throat> you know, Linux ought to run on, you know, uh, CPUs without even a, um, uh, without even virtual memory, right? You know, it should run on the x86. So we should probably compile everything for a really old instruction set, uh, just in case. And so, you know, typically your, your vectorizer is a bit crippled by your choice of uh, architecture. Of course, OpenCL really helps with that, but we'll get to that later. So other optimizations that we, uh, we have, shared formulae. So um, beforehand, uh, hard as it might be to believe, if you fill a formula down a whole column in calc, it would duplicate the formula um, once per cell that it was in. Um, which is fine, but a formula in itself is not actually that simple. So there's a token array which represents the parsed form of this, each of which has a whole load of allocated tokens and strings associated with it um, in two forms, uh, both the visible form and a reverse Polish executable form, and it would exec you know, du duplicate those uh, all the way down, like uh, a, a million times. You would think it would be easy to get to the stage where we could just have one formula and a whole group of them. But in fact, this was hours and weeks of toil and aggravation and uh, you know, unwinding the idea that you should use absolute references everywhere. It would be far faster if you used absolute references for every cell in every one of these duplicated formulas. So huge amount of work again to, uh, to get to this stage, um, but uh, of course yielding some, um, some quite you know, pleasing uh, memory usage reduction. So this is for some monster sheets, hopefully if not terribly uh, representative, but you know, uh, sort of over 100 megabytes off of just pointless bloat from duplicating stuff uh, we didn't need and having bad data structures. So that's pretty useful. Great work from Kohei. Another thing is sharing strings. So strings, um, strings are a bit of a nightmare. Strings seem very simple to programmers, you know? Uh, they read about UTF-8 and their eyes are wide and they think life is good, you know? Um, and that's, that's sort of true, isn't it? Sort of true. If you're comparing for uh, equality, for example, um, maybe uh, case-sensitive equality maybe is an easier uh, problem. Uh, but once case insensitivity comes in, uh, you, you just have this ICU monster of doom, you know, 20 megabytes of table that you look through uh, to work out if, in fact, the string is, is sensible or not. 
And unfortunately, which would be fine, um, but unfortunately string comparisons are used quite a lot. Uh, lots of functions helpfully uh, you know, uh, compare strings and or take parameters that have you know, uh, case insensitive values and, and so on. The pivot tables, particularly um, intensive uh, use of this. Um, so there's some work to do uh, shared string storage so that you can deduplicate strings, store them just once. Um, but, you know, it, w wasn't, it wasn't terribly good. Um, there are various ways you could have done this better, just using indexes for shared strings. But to make the refactoring work better, we actually used normal strings, I guess, this, this string type. And we had uh, two, two um, versions of them, uh, especially collated uppercase one and an uh, original, uh, original one. And so the previous string comparison, every time we would do a string comparison, uh, we would go through this wonderful, you know, get transliteration, you know, two, two different kinds of transliteration, uh, you know, which goes through some unbelievably heavy lifting process. And at the end, then we'll, you know, uh, com compare this, this are they equal um, business, which could be a lot better. Um, and now it is. So, um, yeah, so in this case, of course, you have those transliterations done once, uh, and they're cached. And you can get these ignoring ones, uh, case, case sensitive ones. You know they're unique. So if there is a string that is of that case, you know, it, it says that string when you've uppercased it, there will be only one pointer value for that. So we can just turn this into a relatively simple choice of pointer comparisons. And of course, this is very much faster on the CPU. But from a GPU perspective, this suddenly means the GPU can actually do string case sensitive comparison. It can do equality comparisons and in, you know, uh, case sensitive equality comparisons or inequality comparisons just by looking at the pointer values, um, which <clears throat> is also extremely helpful. Because the GPU, bless it, can't really run 20 meg of ICU table lookups and stuff. It's extremely you know, um, serial type workload. OK, so when we've done all the refactoring, then we need to move on to uh, uh, OpenCL calculation. So, yeah, so I think I was uh, blowing my slide a bit earlier about the whole joys of writing custom assembly. And, and it is fun. I mean, I know if, you, uh, if you've read things like GDK PixBuff, you know, the custom assembly is still there for doing all of the, the scaling and uh, interpolation. Um, but really, it turns out that you could write some OpenCL, and then you could hand that OpenCL to the people that made the processor and know exactly what combination of instructions are going to be on it that will compile something that they believe is optimal uh, for, that, uh, for that use case from the OpenCL, and then execute it where it makes most sense, either the GPU or the CPU. So that's, that's, pretty, that's pretty interesting. And the, the other interesting thing here is this, what they call heterogeneous system architecture. And uh, this sounds like an AMD um, marketing slide, although there's quite a large group around uh, HSA. In fact, loads and loads of mobile devices are like this. Um, HSA essentially means that you have shared virtual memory address space. So previously, GPUs have used um, physical-ish uh, addresses mapped into some kind of aperture. So if, if, you want to, um, if you want to use this great chunk of memory, you know, you have this 8 meg of doubles you want to do something on. Um, you know, you have to fool around configuring your, uh, uh, your GPU to be able to address that thing and, and adapt pointers and so on. And HSA, um, you know, uh, avoids all of that because you can share those, those same pointers into virtual memory addresses uh, directly with the GPU. And it will use the same page tables that your process is using, the same privilege model that your process is using. And so this, you don't have to copy anything. It, it really is uh, rather sexy. Um, so, and of course, it allows the GPU then to address very you know, huge address space and, uh, and operate on things in a, in a pretty sexy way. And so uh, H HSA really makes OpenCL 2.0 uh, work awesomely well, I think. Um, so so I'm, I'm pretty pleased with this innovation. I don't know. If you've, if you've ever struggled with... Uh, uh, trying to make these things perform. If you want to get work to and from uh, GPUs quickly, uh, that's really useful. The other thing is that it, it allows you to do interesting things. So you can have uh, your GPU and CPU working on the same data structures, taking shared locks uh, on the same data structures in memory, and doing interesting calculations, parallel lookups, parallel searches uh, and queries, and building compl complex data structures at the same time, which is, which, is, which is interesting. This has not really happened before. So there's some new... Uh, um, funky stuff there happening in, in OpenCL2. And I think this is an AMD 64-like innovation. I expect to see it everywhere uh, soon. So anyhow, you can look at it there. Now, I'm not an OpenCL expert. I've mentioned multi-core where we're doing a, a lot of this stuff. Um, but if you see the simple sum function here, sum B1 to B3, OK, so this is not a terribly useful case uh, for parallelism. Um, but anyway, it produces a reasonably small kernel. So what we're doing inside here is we're taking the... Uh, reverse Polish form of this, and we're compiling it into arbitrary open uh, CL kernel. 
And so in this case, you can see, oh, I could have a mouse cursor, couldn't I? You can see that it does something pretty funny here. It's a 0, 1, 2. Well, why is that? Well, it's because there are three things in here, and it's custom compiled a sum over those three, uh, three cells. And the reason that you do that, well, in this case, it's a static one, but this window could easily move down a huge, huge column. Uh, and be an, an input to another, another function. So you, you want to get this um, uh, as fast as you can. And so, you know, so the CL compiler will take this guy and it deals with uh, missing numbers as not a number. So if there isn't a number in there, there's some degree of awfulness uh, to deal with uh, missing cells, which is a shame. Um, and in some ways, we could detect the shape of the sheet and avoid that for cases where people have done it right and it's a uniform uh, series of numbers. But in this case, we... Um, we have that. And so you dispatch this thing, it's compiled, and well, hopefully it's cached already, and uh, we execute that. Now, if you have a longer sum, this is actually the same thing for four, four cells, which starts to be um, long enough that we then just put a generic uh, reduction uh, function in there to try and sum these things as wide and as parallel as we can. Uh, bearing in mind that, interestingly, uh, just due to numerical precision, I was mentioning precision earlier, um, you probably want to be adding up in, in massive parallel um, because uh, statistically, you know, small values may be next to each other and not next to huge numbers that would swamp them. And so potentially, arguably, you could even get better precision um, by parallelizing this and, and doing, you know, um, big, big series of these um, uh, staggered ads, arguably. So, so there we go. Um, is anyone good at reading OpenCL? Anyone good at writing it? Anyone have a GPU in their laptop? I, I have a GPU. I must warn you, unfortunately, there, the de there is no demo today, so I'm, I'm sorry if you came looking for it. And, and I had in this, uh, this great chap, Kevin, here, who'd got some great demo, data to demo, uh, but the laptop, which was being FedExed, was not here in time, which is a shame. So I'm sorry about that. But, but either way, there's a whole lot of CL here, and I think if you compare the ease of writing equals some something into a, a spreadsheet, which probably all of you could grasp, you know, by reading the manual a few times and, you know, equals some uh, something, seems easy. Um, Whereas writing this thing, I think, is probably beyond me. At least I, I don't know what these barriers are for and uh, what's going on in there at all. Um, the, the result is that it works, however, and the performance is, is relatively good. I mentioned this is a log plot, again, uh, with milliseconds on the, the x-axis here. And the, uh, the orange one is where you don't want to be. That's where it was before we started the work. And you'll notice that you know, each one of these is a factor of uh, 10, these bars. So you know, it's, it's, it's looking better in, in, many, in many ways. And shorter is better here. So you know, 30 to 500x for these few samples that we, uh, we looked at. So the top one here is just a min-max uh, test. Um, there's, there's, some, there's a human resources uh, one here. This dates work that's trying to work out how many hours someone works a week. Uh, there's a stock, stock trading one. There's some groundwater, groundwater pieces there that are pretty, pretty, uh, pretty nice. And this is all on um, Kaveri, uh, which is AMD's new, new CPU. So, um, yeah, how do you turn it on? Well, here we go. It's not on by default for various reasons, one of them being the general quality of OpenCL drivers out there. Um, but, you know, we're going to fix that. Uh, so you can come to this formula settings, uh, do a custom, custom formula thingy, and, uh, you know, you can enable, enable it here, and it'll tell you a bit about computer units. This is, I think, my laptop. As you see, it's a, a very old... Uh, Core 2 Duo, so uh, it's, uh, it's not really demo worthy. Uh, but you can select which version you want, whether you want your Fire GL Pro or your embedded uh, GPU. You know, which, which one do you want to, uh, to do the work on? Um, and so there's various options there which you can fiddle with, and uh, that's great. So, so th using the GPU is really cool. Um, of course, it needs a lot of stuff. It's so fast, I mean, you, you saw, uh, that uh, it, it really needs a lot of data. So the question is, how do we get all that data in and given that we've just moved a whole load of work to the uh, uh, GPU, uh, perhaps we should use the CPU uh, for something instead. So we've done a lot of work to parallelize loading and parallelize parsing. And this is a bit I actually you know, worked on uh, myself quite a bit uh, with, with Matush, uh, wherever he is. Um, so it um, turns out XML parsing is, a, is, a, is an interesting science, and uh, you know, some parsers are truly lame. And the SACS event model, I was told authoritatively by Daniel Villard, who wrote LibXML2, that SACS does truly uh, suck. It's not, a, it's not a great API for anything. Um, but it turns out that what you can do is, um, and it, it sucks because it destroys your iCache pretty aggressively, right? You, you do all this little bit of parsing, you unzip something, you do a little bit of parsing, you an emit event that sort of disappears deep into your core, and then you come all the way back again and you do a little bit more parsing, and, and this is just really not good. You're using just this huge, huge data set in a, in a not particularly uh, a helpful way. Um, and it turns out, 
that you can improve the API around a parsing significantly by, by moving more work into it. So you can tokenize as well. So instead of dealing in string names, you're dealing in integer tokens, which you can compare quickly. And breaking up namespaces and handling that as well. And then it turns out that you can do all of this in a thread. So that you have a thread doing all of your parsing, tokenizing, namespace handling, and it generates basically a huge linear chunk of memory with all of these things cached in it. And then it hands it over to the thread that's shoving that into your spreadsheet. So the bit that populates the data structures, interprets formulae strings, does that sort of parsing. And we can split this into two fairly equally sized chunks in a, in a beautiful flow process. And it's twice as fast. It's, it's pretty much as simple as that. So assuming that you have a spare CPU around uh, when you're wanting to, uh, to load stuff. Unfortunately, there are still a few uh, black spots in the world. One of them is the standards. Despite my best effort with both ODF and OpenXML, neither of them listen to me. And they, they use this horrible A1, uh, A1 syntax uh, for formulae. Why is it horrible? Well, the problem is that when you fill a whole column with A1 syntax formulae, um, you get A2, A3, A4, A5. So as you go down the column, the formula looks superficially different, despite the fact it's actually the same formula to all intents and purposes, just in a different cell. And there is a syntax that deals with this, which is the R1, C1 syntax, like this, made famous by a, a Lotus, uh, some, some ancient Lotus, uh, what is it? I forget the name of the thing. Um, but, but they created this thing, which was supposedly easy to understand. I think you can see why users prefer to enter this thing rather than this thing. Um, but on the other hand, this is constant all down the road. So instead of parsing the formula, you can just hash it and look it up and say, yeah, it's the same formula. Unfortunately, um, we can't do that for any of our formats, uh, not even ODF. Um, and it turns out that parsing is much, much harder than printing. Much, much harder. There's always allocation and fooling around. So actually, we had a very significant speed up of parsing by instead of parsing the formula, uh, printing the previous formula in the column above, but with one added to it for the row, and seeing if it's the same. Um, pretty sad, really, but you can do this actually without any allocation at all, and it's extremely fast. Um, so, well, you know, needs must when the devil drives. Um, otherwise, we could perhaps fix the standard, but there's a lot of documents out there now that have this. So, anyhow, you add that all together, and um, we have significantly parallelized the load. I mean, there's no point in having all of these compute units not doing anything in your computer. So, at least in OpenXML, um, because that actually uses the new uh, fast parser. Uh, we now unzip, parse, and tokenize in one thread. We populate the sheet data in another thread, and we load multiple sheets in parallel in ex experimental mode. So, so you're basically shoving data through your CPU as fast as you humanly can. And we have a thread that renders the progress bar, because uh, that's important. And uh, we also have a thread that is there pre-compiling to OpenCL your formulae ahead of time, because the CL com compile um, can take some time, depending on how gr gratuitously complicated your formula is um, and how fast your CL implementation is. Um, but that then is happening in the background, ready for when your data is there so we can execute it uh, as quickly as possible. And you have to turn experimental mode on to, uh, to get some of the parallelized sheet loading, but the rest is all there in 4.2. So does it work? Does it make our loads quicker? Well, again, this is another log graph. And, um, uh, I, I've got, a, I don't know if you can see that very well. The yellow is not terribly helpful, is it? Um, so there are three things there. There's calc uh, 413, which is the blue thing. I guess that's the old version. You see the long graphs, you know, that are about 10 uh, longer than anything else. That's where we were six months ago. Um, calc, the red graph is where a calc is now. Actually, I should probably just change this slide. Has, um, wait a second. Let me just uh, edit this slide while I'm here. Uh huh. I didn't know why it says that. Uh, I am terribly sorry. Uh, you didn't see that. Ah, perfect. Good. Now let's hope the uh, display continues to work. Ah, it does. It does. It does. So now how do I do start from current slide? Ah, perfect. And the third bar, which is in yellow, is a comparison. Um, it's um, a, a, a com competitor's product, which I would hate to mention um, in a uh, public talk. Um, <clears throat> but as you see, shorter is better, and uh, we're notably shorter, loading the XLSX file format, which is encouraging. So um, around an uh, average of five-fold speed up um, of loading large data sets. Of course, if you load something terribly small with one sheet and hello mum written in it, um, it's not going to be any faster, I'm sorry. But, you know, there's not much you can do. But if you're loading hundreds of thousands of rows across multiple sheets and, and complex formulae, in, in many cases, will be very significantly faster um, 
and that's great. A quick demo. Oh, yes. Okay. Well, why don't I try a quick demo? This is actually master here. I wonder if it's going to crash on me. That's always fun. So if you have, if you have some time at home, oh, there's a nice new, um, nice new dialogue here. So there's edit, uh, fill. I like, oh, let's see if, um, let's see if Kohei has actually fixed the, uh, the performance bug. Ah, he has. Perfect. So we've just filled a million rows in, in a relatively few uh, seconds. And what we're going to do is we're going to do a, a sum of this thing. Uh, so a dollar one to a dollar, well, you know, a lot. Um, and then we're going to subtract A1, okay? And then we can fill this thing down, which takes uh, a couple of seconds on Kohei's machine, but considerably more on mine. So, so what we've done here is basically create an N squared in a million rows. Um, so sadly, uh, common sub-expression elimination is not very good, and you should test your demos before you try them in front of an audience. Um, <coughs> it turns out. Um, you wanted something fresh, right? You know, I was typing this until very minutes before, uh, before we started. So the fill there is not, not working terribly well, um, which I'm sad about. There are all sorts of uh, potential problems uh, with that. Let's hope it completes. Either way, the punchline is if you try this in a competing suite when you get home, does anyone have a competing suite on their laptop? Is there, are there any Windows users here? Don't be afraid to con confess if you're... Uh, but, no, go on, go on. Some, there must be someone here running. Is anyone running Windows in the auditorium? Where, where, where? There was a... No. Oh, up there, Marcus is. Ah, oh, but that's cheating. He's on the team. He has to run it for interoperability purposes. So, you know, I mean, I, 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 that's, that's, that's not a fair, you know, that's not a fair thing. Um, but if you try this, uh, if you try this in Excel and you just, um, you know, so you do that, that sum fill there, um, you'll find uh, that it's extremely, extremely, like three quarters of an hour to compute. And we can do it in, you know, ah, I don't know, a few seconds on a good day, uh, as you see. Um, so yeah, I should not run master. I should try and run the, uh, the stable version of my, um, uh, let me see if I've got some Fosdem goodness here. And some slides. Cleopatra's Needle. It's interesting, isn't it? What does he have on his computer? I don't know. Okay, so hopefully we'll get back to there. So that was the demo. Did you like the demo? Well, it's good, huh? Yeah, I love it. I'm actually gonna kill the other guy because I think he's probably, um, if you're lucky, X kill will, uh, uh, it actually even worked. That was, uh, that's impressive. So um, let's nip through here. So that's the GPU bit. There's basically totally loads of scope for questions now because this is very questionable. So, you know, does, does anyone want, um, you know, anyone want to ask fun questions? Aha, so at the back, go for it. Yes. Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. So obviously, once we get down to 100 milliseconds, you know, that we, we're probably okay for timing. Um, in this, dates worked. And these, these aren't massive sheets. Uh, they're, they're not, you know, like million row sheets. Um, it just depends on what formulae you've got in them and how they look. So we don't turn on any OpenCL computation until there's 100 a formulae that are basically the same in a row that we contractably uh, deal with. Um, but these are, these are tens of thousands uh, of, of entries uh, there. And then, you know, several copies of them in some cases. But, I mean, we see these around the place. It's amazing. Uh, so, so this dates work thing is, is just some kind of horrible, uh, you know, thing that you see HR departments trying to work out who worked what time by looking up stuff over here uh, and, and fiddling it over here with some, you know, get some H lookups or some well, V lookups, I guess we, we excel at, and try, trying to work out who, who's doing what. Um, yeah, so... Yeah, not, not every spreadsheet will be faster. We don't even bother turning it on until we have, you know, uh, at least some repetitive data. But, you know, if, if you're crunching stocks, for example, and you've got a whole load of stock data coming in, trading information, whatever, it, it's easy to get a lot of data. The problem is, is quite the opposite. It's just processing it and, and presenting it. That's a good question. I have 15 minutes left. Uh, someone else? Go for it. There's more content, incidentally, after the, the OpenCL questions we can have. Talk about LibreOffice 4.2, so don't feel like you have to, but uh, oh, oh, geez. I am very So am I. It's cool. Yeah, yeah, the HSA Foundation. Join it. Join it. Um, so it's not an open source thing. Um, I'm not an expert on that topic, but HSA is basically people driving this view of a heterogeneous system where you have, you know, these compute units and you can move work across them very easily, a really complementary to OpenCL 2.0. And yeah, there's, there's lots of people there, so Samsung, uh, Imagination, uh, AMD, uh, all, all sorts of uh, you know, players involved in that. And as I say, lots of mobile 
uh, GPUs on your phone have this just as a matter of course. It makes sense. It's really, uh, it's, it's really something that's almost, almost obvious. I mean, everything looks obvious in retrospect, right? But, but you know, it's, it, it's pretty cool. So yeah, just look that up. If you search for HSA. Um, so, uh, I don't know. I think it's a corporate consortium to drive a technology outcome. So, you'd have to talk to them. Uh, check online. I, I don't think it's going to be an individual thing. Um, so, yeah. Okay, that was a good question. So, in the beautiful check chat. <laughs> oh. Are you out of luck? Well, um, so, that's a good question. So, so I'll answer a different question, not about Intel CPUs, because I love Intel. You know, they're cool. They support LibreOffice. They're a key member of our, I think, I just happen to have done a lot of work recently on uh, AMD's uh, Kaveri CPU optimizing uh, for that. All of the work that we've done, as you, you can probably guess, applies really well to anything else. OpenCL, uh, even if your GPU is a weak GPU with no double support, for example, um, which we wouldn't, you know, can't really use, uh, then you can compile to your parallel CPUs. So OpenCL will provide that optimized, unrolled, fused, multiplier add, blah thing uh, that will run across multiple CPUs on your, on your CPU. So, you know, uh, very strong CPUs there potentially will, will help you get a win. All of the load time optimizations work well for you. I mean, uh, even if you don't use any OpenCL at all, everything should be quicker. I mean, well, I say lots of things should be quicker. It's hard to optimize without someone losing somewhere, and uh, we're still fixing bugs, it's, but, you know, uh, it's, it's a big win. Uh, another question? Ah, over here, sir. Just shout. Um, what do you think about the OpenMP4 accelerated extensions? Would that make your own life easy? Or assuming it would be on the other Yeah. So, OpenMP. So, I, I don't know enough about it, but it, it seems like, uh, you know, we're eager to do anything that makes sense. Um, like I say, I think the GPU is a very fertile field for putting work on. Uh, particularly on, a, on, a, on a business desktop. You know, if you happen to be running a 3D game at the same time as your uh, desktop, then you're not going to have any spare capacity, but I think that's an unusual work case. So I think um, we've really focused on that, and as I understand, OpenMP is more focused on CPU parallelism. That's why I mentioned the Accelerate extensions. Okay. So come and, come and contribute patches. Whoever turns up gets their stuff in, you know, if, it's, if it works and passes our unit test. So we, we'd love that. Um, one more question, and then I'll go quickly through LibreOffice 4.2. There's so much to say. Go for it, sir. Uh, since you told it's this great OpenCL and HSA, does it mean that it's also portable to ARM architecture, like Chrome Roots? ARM is also a member of the HSA Alliance, and as I understand it, ARM have a great OpenCL support, so I would expect it to work well on ARM as well. Yeah. But you didn't test it yet? Um, my ARM Chromebook with HSA support is uh, not yet arrived uh, as a freebie. So, I, uh, no, I haven't. Um, um, but, you know, if I want to uh, get involved with that, we would love to work with anyone. I mean, you know, we, we are a completely eclectic uh, organization. We like to work with all and sundry, anyone that wants to do cool work, you know, improve uh, productivity for everyone. So, what I'll do is I'm just going to whiz, whiz through a few 4.2 features and, and watch the time that's being waved at me by this wonderful orange gentleman here. And uh, hopefully, we'll, we'll see some fun stuff in 4.2. It's not primarily a GPU or LibreOffice cal uh, calc but other things. So we're improving our UI. Another 280 dialogues. You can see the blue line is where you want to be going and the other ones are dying away, uh, which is cool. You can read Qualon's blog about that. Unit testing, improving the quality. Uh, you know, 2,000 new uh, asserts plus in here, many more test documents. Um, the trend is going in the right direction. And the Android remote has been completely rewritten and uh, is looking um, much more beautiful, particularly if you have good slides with brains on them. Um, we have an iOS remote uh, in this iteration. So if you are a uh, uh, you know, one of those people that sh people shun at parties because they're a supporter of Apple and, you know, that sort of thing. Um, then then you, can, you can still not suffer too much by having a LibreOffice remote. Um, we, we also have a Google Drive integration, which is pretty cool, so you can load and save uh, your documents there. Um, much improved charting, various new kinds of uh, trend lines in, in charting. Um, the math panel on the side actually now previews your math formulae in a much more a uh, rich and beautiful way. Uh, the writer default template is much improved, so by default you get um, better documents. A character board is another important interoperability thing for your illuminated texts, uh, very important. Um, pretty new icons there, so, uh, you know, uh, UI design and graphic art is a, a, a fashion-driven thing, so I'm completely oblivious to it. Um, but these icons look beautiful, apparently. I have been told on good authority uh, that these are, you know, the pinnacle 
of the modern era in, in our world. And I, and I can well believe it. They do look good, don't they? Um, so this is done uh, in Saudi Arabia by a team there um, at Kext. Um, we have a lovely new start screen which shows you big pictures of your documents so that you can click them with a very big uh, finger, if you have a big finger. And, um, you know, you should get finger sharpeners, you know, if you're small mobile device screens. So that would be very useful. Um, better Windows integration. So, yeah, uh, traditionally Windows integration has not been what it could be. So we have group policy integration. If you're a Windows sysadmin, you can manage lots of these guys and lock them down remotely so they can't do any of the new things that we've added in. You know, each new feature should be uh, disableable. And we've also had uh, window grouping and, and nice things for Windows 7. Uh, the Firebird uh, database, this slide is completely mangled, um, is... Uh, actually bringing love to the database backend. So uh, Base itself has, has suffered from, from only having Lionel work. No, I mean, Lionel is awesome. He's working on it, you know, all the time. Where is Lionel? He's, he's somewhere. Aha, awesome. This man is, this man is the rescuer of, of the Base component in LibreOffice and maintains it. Um, but one of the things we've suffered from is having um, HSQL DB, which is a sort of um, a Java database, like a, a SQL-compatible-ish database in Java. And Andre Hunt uh, turned up for Google Summer of Code, funded him brilliantly, and uh, he's written uh, something that uses Firebird as a native database. This is an experimental feature in 4.2. We hope it will be uh, replace HSQL DB in 4.3, and we'll provide a migration path uh, to a fully native database app there. Other new things, tons of work on OpenXML. I can't show you that in pictures. I'm sorry about that, uh, but just loads and loads of work. Uh, three companies have been doing, oh, uh, Calabra have done a whole load of work on that as well with CloudOn uh, funding that very substantially. Hundreds of hundreds of hundreds of patches on round trip interrupts. So now, if we don't understand a, a feature in OpenXML a doc format, docx, we'll store it anyway, and then we'll put it back again. Best leave it alone so we don't break the document in a way we don't understand uh, for the next version. Uh, various other legacy filters, Abbey Word, if you uh, were an Abbey Word user. Apple Keynote filter is an initial cut of that. I think there's, there's more to be done there, but we can at least get some content out of those Keynote slides that people send you. Uh, GNOME 3, uh, menu integration, very important. Commits, going up. Uh, active developers, extremely diverse. Um, tiled rendering, ah oh, yes, mobile devices, so much faster. Uh, potentially tiled rendering for mobile devices. There's some things that are uh, yet yeah, unannounced uh, from some, a company that's involved in the, uh, the community here. But, but looking to the 60 frames a second zoom pan, uh, you know, uh, viewing of, of ADF. So, yep, cumulative unique IP addresses that we actually see pinging us for updates. That, of course, doesn't include any Linux uh, things. The trend is extremely positive. The rate is double what it was a year ago. Um, yeah. Lots of uh, advisory board members supporting LibreOffice, which is extremely cool. Um, so uh, there we are. And my conclusion is that I have five minutes left. LibreOffice is kicking some serious ass, but don't get confused. You know, we still need your help. Uh, you know, it's not done. There is there is a lot more uh, that needs to be done. And there are great ways to get involved. There are easy hacks to do, um, which you, you can do whilst sleeping, and uh, you know, get you into the idea of contributing. Um, OpenCL is, is awesome. HSA is going to uh, change the industry. Um, you know, try not to write that custom hand-coded assembler thing. You know, look for assembler in projects, because there's a reason why it's there, and replace it with OpenCL, you know, because it's going to do a better job uh, in the long run. Um, what else? Yeah, that's pretty much it. We'd love to have you work with us. Come and see me at the end, and see what we can do to change the future of productivity. So, thank you for your patience. You've been very good. Do we have three more minutes for questions? Two more minutes for questions. Any more questions? Any, anything on the last few bits? There's a lot of mooing and shuffling, and I wish I was in the, somewhere else, and maybe I can now escape. Look, these guys are escaping. That's it. No? Okay. Thank you so much.